evening, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. My name is Margaret Hartley. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Academy of Technology and Engineering. And it's absolutely delighted to welcome you all here tonight. Um, it's also my pleasure to uh, recognise the event's co-sponsors, the Convergent Science Network, with here tonight. Uh, also, my own academy is sponsoring, as well as the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne University, here, which are our host tonight. So, thank you to the sponsors for making this possible. I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We also pay respects to all Aboriginal community elders, past and present, who have resided in the area and have been integral part of the history of this region. I think uh, we're in for a really interesting uh, talk tonight from our speaker. But before I introduce her, I just have one of the housekeeping that's usual. Please make sure your phones are on silent. There will be no prize for the phone going off, <laughs> as long as it's mine. <laughs> Um, I think building Australia's future industries and prosperous outlook will really depend on continuing to adopt technological innovation to develop high value products and services, particularly on a global market. So improving collaboration in Australia between and within businesses and between business and publicly funded research um, will significantly enhance this innovation. Over the past um, 25 years, the Clinton's Ross Awards have um, recognised contributions by dedicated individuals to the application of technology for the benefit of Australia. In recognition of that complex nature of the road that goes from research through to research translation, innovation and commercialisation, the Clinton's Ross Entrepreneur of the Year Award was created to honour <coughs> those really special individuals who have been responsible for the creation of a product or a service with a financially successful outcome in either an early stage or mature company environment and also with demonstrated impact for Australia. So it's not easy to win one of these awards, um, but I think you'll all agree with me that Dr Elaine Saunders certainly meets the awards criteria in this phase. She's an audiologist, innovator and entrepreneur who's uh, worked over the past 20 years to successfully disrupt hearing service provision in Australia. Um, I think that that disruption is really um, an exciting part of her work. It's a challenging current business and pricing models and improving technology in partnership with her inventor, uh, Professor Peter Blaney. So her initiatives have created approximately 100 high-tech jobs in the past 20 years. She's culminated in the development of I Hear You, a self-fit hearing aid system and remote teleaudio support models. Um, I think you've now greater than 10,000 units have been sold and she is the CEO of now Blaney Saunders Hears, which has commercialised these technologies to overcome cost and distance barriers and address premium health aid accessibility. I think that mission to improve hearing for 4 million Australians who would benefit from hearing aids but have not been helped by existing audiology service models is probably what drives the Elaine to really want to do more. So enough of me, I think we're all here to hear Elaine tell us about the journey to be an entrepreneur of the year. And so ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr Elaine Saunders. Thank you very, very much. I was very honoured to uh, be given this award, so thank you to ATSI, um, and may I welcome you all tonight, including I see some very distinguished guests here, so I'm sure you all are, so um, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm going to give you a fairly light-hearted uh, look at um, entrepreneurship and my particular journey, uh, recognising the fact that it's six o'clock on a Monday night. Um, so. I will also leave some time for stories. I'm going to focus on, on the more technical part of the talk on uh, the current business and the current innovation, but I'll try and give you a few insights into how I came to be a disruptor. It's what my mother would have predicted from uh, an early year <laughs> stage. The magic moment when you have the first slide's going to move. And then... Oh, 
entrepreneurial rule number one, can you find the on switch? Oh, oh yeah, there we are. So this is why I went into hearing, this is my dad, but that's not why I became an entrepreneur, in fact I think he'd probably been horrified. Um, he had the idea that perhaps I ought to uh, become a bank manager, because <coughs> he thought it was a good steady career. But my dad lost his hearing in his early 20s, and I saw, I wasn't at all sympathetic, I was, as, as he went into his 30s and I was a young child, I was just sort of slightly embarrassed that my dad said things that were slightly older than everyone else's dad did. Um, but as I grew up, I realised the challenges he had, and the challenges he had in his career, and he did a lot of voluntary work with deaf children, which indirectly uh, got me involved in trying to look for solutions so that people could hear better. So my story really started with my father, who classically, as he lost his hearing, uh, didn't have such a strong career path as he would have done otherwise. He actually did very, very well. He, tr he tried hard and he, he did well considering his hearing loss, but not as well as he would have done. And in the end, he retired early and took up a, a, a fairly solitary role uh, chartering boats on the River Dart in, in England. It's not an excuse that, uh, not, a, not a, a coincidence that it was a rather solitary sort of role where hearing and being in meetings wasn't necessary. Hearing loss affects an awful lot of people. It's about four million people in Australia. And so it affects two out of three people um, aged between 60 and 70, and if we have anybody in that de demographic in the room, I guarantee that it'll be that person that's got the hearing difficulties, um, or their father or mother. By 2050, hearing loss is projected to affect one in four of the total population in Australia. Apart from anything else, that is expensive, not just for the individual, but for the country. At the moment, Less than one in five people who would benefit from hearing aids actually use them. So part of my mission is to try and overcome that problem. I saw my father suffer. We know the downstream consequences of hearing difficulties and hearing loss, but still it remains cut somehow out on the side of health. It isn't integrated and we don't take it that seriously. This is a picture of an actor, Jodie Harris, in a play that I produced a couple of years ago, um, entrepreneurs get involved in all sorts of odd things, um, I realised that I was really struggling to convey to people how much hearing difficulties affect people's lives. And I had been aware of Jodie, who was a deaf actor, and of some work, and I raised the money to put on a play. And Jodie's, when we were marketing the play and putting it forward, Jodie's comment was, I had a sort of marketing line which just shows the journey into depression and so she said it's not depression, it's despair. She said I will not have any other word used. And that is Jodie showing that for her, she lost her hearing as a child. She, it was done as an allegory where she turns little by little into a fish under the ocean and she's being sucked into this world of despair. So hearing loss isn't all, it doesn't always lead people to despair, it depends how severe and hers was very, very severe. But it is well known that hearing difficulties and an untreated hearing loss does lead on to mental health issues, depression, loss of employment, reduction in employment, all of which could be avoided with good use of hearing aids. So this is a very talented actor just displaying the reason why if you can get hearing treatment, you should. She actually is a very, very good user of a cochlear implant. Hearing loss untreated can also accelerate the onset of dementia. This is data that's uh, been suspected, or this is a condition that's been suspected for some time, and in the last two years has been thoroughly validated by a number of different scientific groups, partly using uh, longitudinal ageing studies, but also partly using um, electrical scanning technologies. So you see on one side here the, uh, the brain with hearing loss and no hearing aid treatment, and on the other side, normal hearing. It does lose, it does cause brain changes. At a simpler level, not having hearing go up the hearing pathways to the brain, just, um, it, it, it is a kind of actuary, I suppose, it's used or lose its sense. The hearing nerves cease to convey the information that the brain needs to interpret sound, 
I, I know I'm in a room full of scientists, but I um, also recognise it's very mixed background, so forgive me if I'm, if I'm making this too basic. But in an ordinary hearing situation, the brain codes the sound exactly as transmitted up the auditory pathway from the inner ear. When that pathway is disrupted and there was inadequate signal, the brain gives up doing that and loses the patterning. And the way that that uh, trans uh, shows itself is a difficulty in understanding speech. <coughs> so that people who don't treat hearing loss find after a while it's very hard to code speech and if you give them hearing aids, they still find it hard to code speech. And the longer it's left, the harder it is. Conversely, if you do get on with hearing aids early and your hearing gets worse, you're never likely to be without a solution because when you run out of hearing aid um, <coughs> amplification, you'd be able to use cochlear implants. So I say to people, if you have a hearing plan and get on with it, you'll always have a solution. I want to bring it back in Australia very topically with um, the uh, events of the weekend, or the non-events of the weekend, um, to cost. We know that healthcare costs in Australia are rising. We know we have to do something. <coughs> we know we have to do things differently. It doesn't have to necessarily be by charging more for services. What it should be in today's environment is in doing things di differently. So this slide, I want to acknowledge a, a colleague of mine, Sarah, Sarah Dodds, um, provided with this slide. But what she shows on this is that as the, um, over the next, up until 20, 43, 44, health, healthcare costs in the state, where of course we have the hospital burden, will increase to a point where it's all we've got the money for. We've got money for nothing else. If we looked at it, uh, across Australia it's not quite so bad except I think most people would like to consider that some of their money gets spent on like, a defence or educational roads, things like that. So we have a real challenge with healthcare costs. It, to talk about it in terms of Medicare co-payments is of course very topical for the weekend but that's not really our challenge. Our challenge is doing things smarter. I believe that we can provide better healthcare than at the moment if we do it smarter and we can do it at less cost because the model that we're using there must be similar sorts of things you can do in many many areas of medicine and one of the fundamental things that we're doing is saying well some people can help themselves if they can let them do it and then we can save our big dollars for people where that's not appropriate I'm going to just leap into a sort of semi-commercial slide about the hearing aids we're doing, about how the impact of the cost on the model in that this, in the hearing aid industry, traditionally hearing aids have been sold in kind of technology tiers. It's a bit like taking all the cars you know and instead of calling them brands and talking about their engine size and their qualities, you just say you can have a basic car, a medium car or a top level model, which of course we don't do. Um, but that's how hearing aids have been sold. And typically, uh, this, this actually was published only a couple of years ago from so-called independent data, maybe it was. Um, and it priced an entry-level digital hearing aid at around $1,300 for one, going through a range to a premium tech hearing aid at around 5500 This is one, bear in mind, most people use two. And calling it entry-level basic advanced and premium and so very very often in a hearing aid retailer people will be faced with this range so what they will do they'll choose something in the middle and they are not getting a premium hearing aid so hearing aids have kind of been bought on price which actually has been quite a challenge for us in our marketing but we'll take questions on that what we've done is turn it upside down and say well we've developed premium level hearing aids but we're going to sell those at the, the basic price and we can do that by making a model where, which is scalable where we have a central source of expertise and we let people fit their own hearing aids but service them from our central source of expertise if they want that help and in doing that we can make the whole service and product supply much much cheaper. A challenge in 
health administration, particularly if the health device is a device, i.e. procurement of widgets, is that at a government level there will be just that procurement of widgets. Whereas what we need to be doing at the moment in health, I feel very, very strongly, is looking at how the health is delivered. And I know there are studies going on here at Swinburne in that kind of area. I'll tell you, um, Jonathan, I might distract you from that one for a moment. I think I want to just jump into being an entrepreneur for a moment. I've been in hearing, and hearing has been the core. I think I would probably always have been an, an entrepreneur. I like to see things work. I like to find solutions. Um, when I was at school, I was the person who rounded up a team, managed to persuade people that they wanted to enter something that they never knew they could do. And the people who were, they'd enter a music competition when they'd never sung before. I'd have an idea and I could see a way to do it, so I did it, and they would follow me. I didn't like rules at school unless I could really see a, a good um, reason for them, which led to many school uniform infringement <coughs> charges. Um, but I could, was never short, never afraid to uh, to find, offer a better solution. I must have been terribly irritating. In my first job, I spent a number of years, I think, being what is today called an entrepreneur. I worked for big organisations and I looked for solutions and I didn't really think about being an entrepreneur, I just looked for solutions. My first job, with, armed with a, a master's degree in audiological science, I found myself in charge of 22 hospitals in North West London region and six teaching hospitals and two partial hearing units. So, um, you know that up. The staff in all those units were much older and much more experienced than me but didn't, weren't armed with a Master's in Audiological Science. My job was to uh, increase, if the, improve the standards of hearing testing and hearing aid fitting across that region, uh, which would be about a 14th of England. And I suppose I went in there, frankly I hadn't a clue what to do. Um, to make matters slightly more scary, I was put in a medical physics department. I was, of course, the only girl. Uh, that was probably the least of my worries. Um, and all the other staff were oncologists. So I didn't have a lot of support. I won't go into the depths of that year. I did survive it. Um, I didn't stay longer than about 18 months, but that wasn't because I was miserable. It's because I actually really wanted to work on the ground and experience something other than a management role at the beginning of my career. But the, um, the main triumph for me of that year was that I obtained, through just some good network and good connections, I found myself a proud caretaker of a very wonderful lab of sound measurement equipment. I think it was a retiring professor who left me the legacy of all the equipment that had come on his grants over the years. So I set up a technology uh, calibration and maintenance service for the whole of that region. And that was the first private unit set up in the National Health Service, and as far as I know, it's still running. And all these people in all these hospitals would wonder who this dreadful upstart at 22 years old armed with a master's degree was, suddenly loved me because we could fix things. So firstly, it, it did lead to the result they wanted, which was better outcomes. Secondly, it, it uh, it was economically successful. And thirdly, it was a huge lesson to me that when you go into a situation, you have to find a solution. And I've always said that in any environment, in any problem, it's really, really helpful as an entrepreneur. Something happens, and it will happen. Stuff happens, to put it politely. And you have to find a solution. You can call it perseverance, you can call it being knocked over and having to find your way up again, but you have to find solutions. So that was my first attempt at finding a solution where the, really the only problem was me in that I felt totally overwhelmed out of my debt. But I had to find a solution to that, and I did. So I guess my message there is that I think you might start out with some characteristics of entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean you can't learn all the skills, and you certainly should, and I've certainly done a lot of formal education that's helped. Uh, but it's really about going the path that you need to go. If you want somebody who wants to find solutions, go out and find them. So our solution now, 
I'll just go into this slide a little bit, is that we did some focus groups and found that although people know they've got hearing difficulties, they actually like someone else to tell them. I think sometimes it's kind of a hope that they'll tell them that you're dreaming, you haven't really got hearing difficulties. But we want to do this on an online model, so we developed a, a hearing test which can be done at comfortable listening levels, sort of in anybody's relatively quiet room. I wouldn't you know, do it on Flinders Street Station. Um, and you listen to 50 words, and then we, uh, we collect all that data, and information transmission analysis is actually done on, on the responses to those words. And what the client gets back is a graph that shows what sounds of speech they hear well and what sounds of speech they don't hear well. So you've kind of given the information of the pass fail, but it's given a bit more than that, so you don't actually have to have it as a pass fail. It actually stops someone going banging back into the living room and saying, see honey, I hear perfectly. Because the chances are that if they have, think they have difficulties, they don't hear perfectly, but it's not a pass fail, it's information. However, we make good use of that information. If that person is motivated then to go on and buy hearing aids, we of course have that data, um, all in the cloud, and we use that, um, those results to put the initial settings in the hearing aids. So hearing aids go out to the person who has done this test with some initial settings in, which actually turn out to be pretty good. However, we do recommend that they personalise it further and we've developed a very, very simple front-end system. Hearing aids have been designed by the hearing aid manufacturers to be very tricky to set up. There's probably a very good retail reason for that. Um, so what we've done is made it very easy. That's partly we've been able to do that because of the technology in the hearing aid and partly because of the, the way that we've done the fitting software. It can be done on a smartphone, on a, a tablet, or on a computer. The interface, since uh, the FDA frowns upon us uh, plugging people into computers, is a Bluetooth device. It's not really helpful as if I use that there. It's a little Bluetooth device, which is actually made by SRX in Dan Um And it, it, that is the pro that's the audiologist, that's the programmer. So when the people get their hearing aids, we encourage them to get out the programmer, plug the wires into the hearing aids, and then customise it for themselves. That customisation means listening to five sounds and making them sound about as loud as each other. There's not really anything else to do. Although we have got several layers of, of tuning, and that's especially for engineers. <laughs> I have people to take them out daily. We left this initially wired, actually it won't be in our next iteration, but it, we wanted it wired deliberately because I didn't want people to use it as a, as a remote control and run around with it all the time. All you have to do is set it up, then put it all away and use the hearing aids. The hearing aid it, um, system itself is very robust, very flexible, it's fully adaptable, so you don't actually need lots and lots of programs, and that again was deliberate. I have been known to set up lots of programs because someone has thought it was a good value proposition. How many programs can I have? I'll have them all. So, you know, you have to be flexible. This is one of my team programming someone's hearing aids for them at home. So they, that, that someone would be someone who's had some difficulty, didn't feel confident or wasn't able to, set, to do it themselves. So they're on the internet, he's taken over their computer, he's doing it for them. And that really overcomes the access. So we've tackled two things. One is access and one is cost. And access is not just about living 600k from the nearest town, it's also about living um, with reduced mobility. There are a lot of older people who simply can't get out in a bag. So what we've done there in summary really is to give the power to the consumer, we've reduced the price, we've given them actually more option in customising, and we've taken them out of a confronting face-to-face -face retail situation. That actually hasn't made me particularly popular with either 
the audiologists in Australia are all the big hearing aid companies. The big hearing aid companies don't mind too much because they know they could stamp on me at the moment, um, which is a situation I'm managing carefully. The audiologists are actually coming round, and this is a really interesting thing, I think, for people going out as disruptors. They're coming round from being my, my arch enemies and stabbing me multiple times in the back or on LinkedIn or whatever, <laughs> um, to saying, well, how, how can we do this? So it's quite interesting to, to see that, that change. And the challenge, of course, is surviving that and continuing to lead. This is my futuristic slide. Everything we do, we have a massive amount of data because everything that we do with our clients, as long as they're online, is collected. We, we track their hearing and the hearing aids, it's data locked. And we keep it in the cloud, and that puts us in an excellent position for working with eHealth Records. And when it becomes a little clearer which horse to back in that area, um, it will be quite easy for us to, uh, to set up portals for our clients to manage their hearing. So this is to show that we consider that the, the end user, the hearing aid user, needs a flexible approach. They, they can have as little or as much help as they want, and they can go back into a mainstream face-to-face -face clinic if they want, hopefully with us, or with someone else, and they, we expect them to interface with their ENT and GP as usual and make it very easy for that person to get results. So we're giving people a lot more information You've got, to, um, you've got to continue to be creative. I've got to be ahead of other people. I, I want this to succeed. And I'm not short of ideas, people. I'm very, very proud of my team. I think that one of my skills is finding people who are much cleverer than me. And I try and give them enough space to really operate. But there is that danger that there will be too many ideas. And I have to say, one of the things, if you have your own business out there, it's a bit like, for the women in the room, it's a bit like having a new baby. Everyone wants to come and give you advice. And there's lots of ideas put forward, and I'm sure some of them are good. Some of them, if you followed them all, you know, we'd go broke. So it's being creative, but also being focused. I put this up because I'm the discerning of you will know that's Hippocrates, who in the, uh, about the four, fourth century BC was founding medicine as we know it today hasn't actually changed terribly much. It has been a very paternalistic model. An approach of to saying, let's, let's tweak the way Medicare is funded or something like that, doesn't question that at all. But if you look below, one of my favorite organizations in the US is the uh, Organization for Participatory Medicine, which has its own journal. And a quote direct from a patient is, I no longer have to go and see the doctor. The patient portal is changing medical practice. I couldn't resist the cartoon. I'm not quite sure what Hippocrates would have thought about it. I think actually he probably quite liked it because he wanted people to get better. What's behind us is some simple, it's a simple concept, but it's actually enabled by some core technologies. The core processing in our hearing aids, and there's quite a lot of processing in it, but part of the core is um, clinically pro proven technology which morphed across from work we'd previously done in the bionic ear. The system's fully customizable, so there's no need for an on-site audiologist. Customers can set it up and adjust it all themselves, but we provide absolutely comprehensive telehealth, no problems too big or too small. And to give an idea there, we have somebody at frontline support that actually has the dubious honor of being our IT manager as well, who has to know about a lot of types of computers because you know you'll find out that oh the system works really really well but actually it doesn't work on Toshiba I wonder why we don't know so you have to um, we, we have to do a lot of um, very basic help sometimes with the computers um, effectively to cut to the chase on this everything we've done is is scientifically and commercially it's scientifically and commercially validated. So I think that comes to Margaret's point early. We've come from science, we are scientists. What we're trying to do is make a difference. And we're doing it in a, in a for-profit company, I call it a profit for purpose company, because that's actually the best way I think to get, it's really the only way to get technologies widely used. The road to today for us was long, winding, 
and often uphill, and I expect there to be a lot more bumps. I was asked um, not long ago what I thought was what I'd done best in my career, and I thought I hadn't done it yet, and I'd still say that today. Um, you have to not be deterred. In the previous company around dynamic hearing, we sold technologies where the deals were worth, technologies to hearing aid companies, where the deals were worth millions of dollars. Our first customer um, overexpanded, not because of us, it has nothing to do with us, but they went into liquidation. I was on a plane the next day, so what I needed was another big customer to fill that gap. Just a reminder, a commercial plug here. When, one of the things we've done on the marketing side is make sure it looks nice. We felt it was very, very important that if we were going out direct to the client, we had a nice box that opened up with nice things in it and it looked nice. So this is the scientist going into the field of um, ergonomics and marketing and branding. I thought I'd give you a quick glimpse of the uh, interface that people have to deal with. They have to use these sliders, whether it's on the phone or uh, on the computer, to make five sounds sound about the same loudness. Um, I won't go into the details of the program, but all they have to do is get one line on top of another if, if they want to go deeper into the program, or if they're engineers, they want to write and tell me how they found a way to do it better, which is fun. I'll finish with this. The most dangerous words in the English language are, it's always been done this way. If you're in health, that will come to hit you all the time. It's always been done this way, and we've got a certificate to prove it. Um, we have to challenge things as they are, but as an entrepreneur, I know what my values are. I want to help people hear better. I want to leave the world a slightly better place than I found it, one little brick in the wall. Um, and I think if you have those core values, whatever you want them to be, they don't have to be the same as mine, then that path to being an entrepreneur can be very, very rich. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Oh, that about right for questions? Oh, yes, I'm all the time for questions are better, I think. So, do people have questions? And um, I should advertise oh, yes. that um, we're going to give two the two best questions. I don't know who's going to judge that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get um, Elaine's, a uh, copy of Elaine's uh, novel. Uh, novel. No, it's not a novel. <laughs> Sound of Silence. It yeah. tells the story of this yeah. child a lot more detail. It's a trailer. It's an excellent <laughs> read. So, uh, let's start. Back there. Yes. Thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. My question for you is, what has your experience been like as a female disruptor in Australia? That's a, it's a good question. Did everyone hear it? Um, what's it been like as a female disruptor in Australia? I was very privileged to win the Telstra Businesswoman of the Year Award in 2004. To be honest, until that point, I don't think I thought very much about being um, a female entrepreneur, it's just a job to do. Um, it's worth thinking about it though, because there are challenges that are there because of gender, and I probably just blindly battled through them. Um, I don't think I've really, I don't know if I felt discrimination about, about against it or not. I mean, to be honest, the weight of being a disruptor is so strong that whether you're a male or a female, probably is secondary. I will share, if, I, if you don't mind, a, a, an anecdote from that first career when I was with all the male oncologists in uh, the hospital in London, in that there were two people per office, and my male colleague in my office got teased for having a girl in his office. And they said, presumably you talk about, and this was, this was the late 70s, presumably you talk about um, Knitting patterns and things. I should put it on record that I, I don't knit. Um, <coughs> on um, April Fool's Day, every member of that uh, department got their internal mail absolutely stuffed full of recipes and knitting patterns. <laughs> Except me, oddly enough. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, can, is it set up such that family members could help their parents, given that they may? Um, be more you know, inclined to, to have their children or um, 
sisters or whatever help them with it? Yes, it, it, it is. In fact, we encourage communities to do it. Sometimes we get little groups. Um, there's a small town up north the border called Finley where a, there's a, a, an expert in town who I think he's equipped everyone in Finley with hearing aids. Um, <laughs> but yes, it's very, very um, amenable to that. And in fact, one of our customers was a chap whose father was in northern China and he went home to China and set up his, um, he had a little bit of help with us over the net, and he helped us a bit with the Chinese. Um, but we set up uh, this client there, we set up another person in Finland, similarly with a, a parent, so it's very, very amenable to that. Depends ultimately on your relationship with the parent. How <laughs> uh, will you source of information for The path has been quite complicated financially. Uh, the first company that uh, we worked in, Dynamic Hearing, which is where some of these core technologies were developed, was a spin-off from the CRC for Cochlear Implant and Hearing Aid Innovation, uh, and it was owned, but it was owned by Venture Capital. It was not a, a well-done deal. I hasten to put up my hand so I didn't do it. Um, but it was owned by Venture Capital. Of course, when it came time to sell the company, um, it's Venture Capital owned. Uh, I suppose it's good to talk about failures. I did, I did try and buy it, but I had very little hope of buying it, partly because the uh, raising capital to, to buy at the timing was really bad, and because I didn't own any of it, so I hadn't got a sort of leg up at all. However, we... Um, have been able to reaccess the technologies through a combination of um, skill, good partnerships, and a bit of luck. Um, and the current company was financed in what I think some people call a soft startup model, in that we actually um, found a way to generate income from the beginning so that we had had some revenue to use. And we've moved away from that source of revenue more and more into independence so that by uh, the company is now 100% Australian owned. Um, I suppose some of the finance won't have to count as my house and, and, and Peter's. Um, but we don't have investment in it. We've done it by raising revenue and by using personal and by working with good partners. So you don't actually have to own everything. You can work with good partners and not own everything. Yes, I had a question about the testing. You mentioned that it was speech focused. Yes. Is it applicable for musicians as well? The, the, um, well, it depends on the language. So for musicians, uh, if they, it's, a, it's a good test of hearing, and musicians um, would be advised to really check their hearing. Um, in working with different languages, that's actually quite a challenge for us because it's not, it, we have, do have different accents, we've licensed it in the US, um, but different languages, it's about phonetic balance, it's not about translation. But musicians, um, I would strongly encourage to check their hearing regularly, whether it's classical or Anything else? Um, when you started the presentation with your, your father and the whole quality of life issues around hearing and then the dementia slide, so hearing is clearly one of our important senses and there's massive um, upstream quality of life issues. What's always confused me about audiology is its need to stick to just frequency spectrum and amplification. And my question is, what do you see in terms of the future of audiology moving up the value chain, as is personalised medicine and et cetera, to more quality of life issues, rather than just focusing on a reduction clinical issue? It's, I think that's a really good question, actually. It's the, the, um, the context has partly come from history in that audiology emerged both in Australia and in the United States as a, a, a means to reimburse or, or to give some compensation to returning soldiers. The reason we used a pure tone audiometer with the particular eight frequencies that are on it is because when the first audiometer was developed that was the eight frequencies they, they made. Um, so it's evolved 
as um, quantify the hearing loss and then correct it in some way. And hearing aids were the obvious thing to, to use and have been since the early 1900s. Another talk on the history of hearing aids. Um, since then, they've been, become smaller and more discreet, but it's really only relatively recently they've actually become very effective. But the reimbursement around hearing has actually been device focused, and it still is. There is no reimbursement for the softer side of audiology at all. So what that's led to is the, is the build-up of hearing aid shops and of a bundling of services into, uh, in, into the price. We charge clinical consultations fees, and I'm very, very transparent about that. Um, but we occasionally get people to say, why do I have to pay? So I say, you know, do you, who else do you not pay? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so, so that, that's really it. It's, it's, about, it's about reimbursement. I've got a question here in the front and here and back there. Thank you. That's a wonderful presentation. It's really very inspiring. It seems to me that um, you also clarified something that puzzled me. Why were the audiologists so resistant? Well, obviously, they're making a bigger profit margin on the most yes. expensive models. But the audiologists should be your natural allies, and they, you should operate through a system on them. The, the answer to that question is that we don't really have enough margin to give away in, in the uh, quantity with which they are accustomed. Yes. So we can give them a margin, but not very good one. The, the, more, the more nimble and agile ones, the famous politician, shouldn't be cut out of the business as Well, what they don't understand at this point is that uh, in, in commercial terms, we are a volume business. And uh, audiologists are not. They sell two or four pairs of hearing aids a week. They feel very comfortable. Yes. We are going out through through pharmacists though shortly, in a sort of in between model. I think that's a great story. You told us the business yet to come, so we'll work with it. Um, just one comment and a question. I'm very interested in your online test and the, the, the way that can I don't know get you over the denial. Barrier, so I'll have to go home and try it. <laughs> but, uh, I'm very curious as to how you settled on your price point. You know, there's a factor of four out there. What's, how would you pick that spin spot? I would have been astonished if I hadn't had that question. <laughs> so um, actually, we did it bottom up, and truth to tell, we probably made it too low. But it's hard to put your prices up. Um, but we worked out what margin we thought we needed to run the business. And that's where we settle on our price point. And we certainly have had the challenge of people saying, is it okay, is it too cheap? What is the price? It's um, for our premium hearing aids, it's $4,000 for two, including all the programming system and online support. So you get your programmer and software. So that's a premium hearing aid. And the comparison would be upwards of 10. Um, thank you also from me. Um, I'd like to ask an intellectual property question. Um, are you able to protect your business adequately through intellectual property laws or do you rely on having your secret source, if you like, actually uh, in-house and on your own computers and not letting it leak out? And perhaps a supplementary question, would you be happy if, for example, your business model and everything to do with it was suddenly adopted in China and there was you know, hundreds of millions of um, copies? It's quite a lot of questions there. Well, so firstly, we're a, a products and services business, and if we were never to expand outside Australia and New Zealand, I think we would still have a viable business. Um, my reading of the, uh, go to the beginning there, we can't fully protect the, the system. It's a mixture of, um, of IP and know-how. Um, but I have been in that situation before, and I think the answer there is to run faster. I'm also an ex-athlete, so yeah. being competitive is kind of second nature. But I think um, 
we don't have legacy products, we don't have a legacy business, and that's uh, and we don't rely on an established uh, retail chain or, or an established um, business model and with intermediaries for our future. Should it happen in China? Well, it probably could, but I don't know that that would worry us terribly. Um, we will certainly, over the next two years, be looking internationally. We are also, small I forgot to mention this earlier, some people know it anyway, we will be fully manufactured in um, Australia, in Victoria, by this time next year, um, with some quite novel hearing aids, which I'm very proud to say Swinburne is involved in. Um, so the answer is, no, we can't fully protect it. Where there's a margin, somebody wants it. But I think that we will, um, I, I, my gut feel is we'll be okay, but we will be looking for suitable partners. I've been aware that we should probably have somebody in the investment team, it's not really a money question, but somebody in the uh, structure who has bigger muscles than me. certainly does. I can say quite a lot about the background briefing program because I've tried to contact the lady involved and I have I have to say I wonder whether she exists. Um, however, it's partly the structure and it's partly the fact that if you're a young audiologist going out to work for big company X, you actually haven't got much choice about how you work. You have sales figures to fulfil if you want to keep your job. Uh, you might have commissions, but it's not it's not your deal. It's why I think regulation will do nothing whatsoever. Uh, I'm, I think I just don't think it's worth pursuing. Rorting, they actually use the word rorting. I'm not entirely sure that, or I certainly don't know of rorting. I do know of high price points. Um, and I don't think anyone should be paying ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 for hearing aids. It's, but it's, it's a business issue. It's straight retail profit. Rorting is a very strong word. I have the uh, woman in, uh, no, I'm oh. sorry, behind me, yes. Um, and the gentleman asked a question that I was going to ask about um, intellectual property. So, um, just one further question. Do you have IP for Australia or patents? Yes. I do. Yes. So it's Australia <coughs> only in the state? Oh no, it's not Australia only. No, we we certainly are very mindful of our of our patent strategy. So Elaine, around around the psychology and and that side of this whole thing of hearing aids, we accept glasses. They're not seen as an aging issue. What is it about hearing aids that seems to be? Um, you can make it easy, but if people aren't willing to wear them or are constantly thinking they don't need them. What's known about how do we help people understand that impact and that value? I think this is a very changing dynamic. I mean, there's always been a quest to make hearing aids smaller. They have been a fashion statement in the past in that if you were going to uh, be the chaperone at a, a Regency dance, you would have been there with your crystal ear trumpet trimmed with black lace and you would hope it was nicer than everyone else's. Um, so they have been a fashion statement. But I, I, my theory is that because hearing aids have been in many economies free for, uh, for people over a certain age, that it's been firmly associated with, well, you know, get hearing aids when you're old and you're on the pension. And so I think it's been reinforced. In contrast with that today, there is a lot of information now about the importance of hearing for career development, for 
keeping a job, getting that next promotion, not falling asleep in the board meeting, um, and now particularly with the association with dementia. If you stand in front of a group of people and say, well, if you don't treat your hearing loss, you're twice as likely to get dementia, they listen for the first time. Uh, there was a company called uh, Sonatus um, out of California, I think, um, that had interesting technology and products um, around bone induction through the jaw. Uh, they went um, bankrupt a year or so ago. Are there any lessons, if you know, out of that company and that situation, because I was interested in them, um, you know, from a health, entrepreneurial, scientific or, or business uh, point of view that could, um, could help us either understand what happened there or more generally from the business in Australia? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things there and I think, uh, I hope I don't live to regret this statement and if I do, please don't all of you come around and say, she said that late. When we start out with this company and the sort of price point and the model, uh, discussion that we had was, well, lots of people have thought they could transform the hearing aid industry and come out with, you know, a disposable hearing aid, or, uh, and they failed. And we think we're going to succeed. And I was absolutely prepared to back myself on that, and I still think we're going to succeed, but I was aware that there were quite a lot of uh, corpses along the way. The hearing aid industry, in many ways, has been ripe for disruption. With the, uh, the bone induction hearing aid, um, frankly, I don't think it was as good a product as we've got. And I think that although we constantly sing the praises of all the investment money available in um, California, there's some, no one will like me saying this, but there is actually some merit in being lean. You have to think very hard about where your dollars are coming from and where they're going to be spent. It certainly um, keeps, you, keeps you on your toes. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I was sort of just thinking um, a lot about uh, the concept of the hearing aid, because you can get a premium quality hearing aid and you can get a basic quality hearing aid. And unlike, say, for instance, a, a pair of spectacles, you know, there are different uh, variations to the glasses and you're paying, you're paying a premium, but it's a one-off manufacturer of the glass. Whereas a hearing aid, you could be wearing the same hearing aid if it's basic, and then you upgrade, you can have it upgrade the, uh, the program so that the hearing aid became, becomes a premium quality hearing aid. So, I mean, do you get, I mean, you, you get people sort of thinking, hang on, it's the same hearing aid, all you're really doing is, is upgrading the program, and then it becomes a premium quality hearing aid. Um, do you get some people disappointed about that, or is it because they're not sort of getting a brand new hearing aid? We don't actually update the uh, software in the existing hearing aids. We, we could, but generally if you're going to have a new hearing aid, you're going, firstly it's financial, it's a business issue, and secondly it's, um, it is because of the psychology, you want someone to have a new hearing, new, a hearing aid, and you probably are making improvements because you always learn. So we don't actually update the software on the, on the chip. Um, we have done, either in conjunction with big manufacturers or ourselves, a number of studies over the years where we have put um, a, double, a double EEPROM in a hearing aid and uh, effectively done studies on hearing aid processing where they don't know that they've got a new hearing aid. And the, um, that's been quite a, quite a good way to do hearing aid research. It's actually quite rare. Um, some of the research that we've done along the way in this has actually been quite unique research in uh, looking at, at how you validate signal processing in hearing aids. Hey, Lena, I wonder, can I ask you back to these uh, shops? My observation of them is, and it's probably wrong, you've got a whole lot of get rich quick people there. Now, if you're as old as me, you know that those people don't last. And I can't quite understand your marketing strategy. I mean, you've got the premium product at a low price, and you've got all these people using the crooks out there selling a very high price product. It seems to me that would be a market's dream. 
It's quite hard to attack because uh, it, I, mean, I think the hearing aid industry in Australia and the hearing aid distribution system is completely broken. Um, I, I think it's, it's the, both the public and the private system, the way they work together, it's just broken. And, but I don't want to play into that um, same area, partly because I personally have a, a moral objection to uh, making money out of people who have um, difficulties. Uh, and partly because our model is scalable and theirs is not. We can sell I, our clinics, and we will have several across the country be, by the end of the year, um, are 20 times more efficient than any of the retail shops because of our model. And I also think on the pricing side, people are becoming, they actually are becoming more educated. And we have a triage call centre where most people who buy from us phone before they buy. And we get quite sophisticated questions. They've done their research on the web. So whilst there are still people who are prepared to walk into a hearing aid shop and spend 12 grand, there are a lot more who are doing, a lot of people and enough for us who are doing their research. So I don't know if that answers the question really. Other questions? Elaine, a big part of the disruptive nature of your, your business model is, is obviously going in line with the interfacing with the hearing aid as much as the technology itself. Okay. And you must have looked into that fairly extensively given the fact that most of the demographics probably not really big users of online services and you have to bring about that behavioural change to actually make the business succeed. There are three parts to the answer to that. Firstly, they are the fastest on growing group online. One of the, cha the challenges with the older group actually is that they're online, but they, they think that their computers shouldn't be updated too often, so you might be dealing with a computer that's quite a few years old. Um, they're partly they're self-selecting for us in that we want people who are comfortable online, so it, sa it saves us getting criticism from saying, well, surely people will buy your hearing aids and then they'll be stuck because they won't be able to, to use their computer. Well, no, because if they found us, they probably can. But the other one goes uh, back to Leone's question, actually, is that quite often people are very happy with the hearing aids and with the service and with the accessibility, and they bring in an older relative or a friend. So, uh, and I, 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 I perhaps just to indulge me and, and take one other point, which is that I think this is a, going to be very much part of health in the home too. So that's where I see it going. That's where the older communities will come and it won't be unassisted. We'll have the same sort of help that um, people with other in-home technologies would have. Lane, just correct me on the medical side of this, but as I understand it, the real problem is hearing is the membrane gets loose. It's the membrane in your ear that gets loose, so it doesn't count as a sound. Is that correct? It's not very common, and that would be surgically treatable. Yeah, so what's the main medical issue? Why you need it? The two most common reasons why you need hearing aid, it's, it's, it's damage to the sensitivity in the inner ear. And the uh, two villains are, one is frankly ageing. Hearing is at its best and on its way down after you're um, 10 years old. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other is noise um, and, and damage. And uh, I was talking earlier with the uh, Margaret and about and Beth about um, a very common cause of hearing loss amongst some of one of our direct demographics. The sort of I suppose they'd be in our clinic situation. We do have clinics. Is the old .303 rifle, which was used by cadets. And I shared a, a comment earlier that when I was talking to a gentleman about that and saying, "Well, it was terrible that people were allowed to use those, and you know, without hearing protection, and damage their hearing." He said, "I don't know what you're worried about. I used to take it home in my school bag." But um, n noise damage is poorly understood. One burst of uh, over intense sound is permanent damage, even if it feels better the next day. And our hearing conservation strategies are still quite poor. So it's noise and age fundamentally. There are other things, but that's the most common. So, uh, 
unlike, say, for instance, the retina damage, which shortly there are already uh, growing retinas in uh, peak conditions, you're not going to have that competition with you. I think there will be competition from uh, therapeutics, but I don't think it will be in a time frame that uh, yeah, right. troubles me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was within the next, say, towards the end of the next decade. But it, it's not that far ahead. But it's um, uh, it's not a business concern of mine at the moment. Yes. Thanks, for the talk. How do you explain the economic and the technological success of the hearing aids from Costco. You know, I sometimes say to people, well, if you're not going to have our hearing aids, which I think are the best in the world, or well, that I know are the best in the world, go to Costco, you'll get a really good deal. So it's partly the Costco business model itself. Um, they have huge buying power. I have actually supplied technology to Costco in the past. They require very, very high standards and they pay very low prices. Um, where they succeed also is rebranding last year's model. So they, their own brand hearing aids at the moment are last year's model from one of the big manufacturers and you would have paid ten or $12,000 for them last year or the year before and now they're in Costco for three or $4,000. Um, having said that, when you read the uh, annual report of the supplier, there's far from um, it's far from clear that it's a particularly good deal for them. So Costco is a good buy. They get very very good prices from their suppliers. Are you proposing to um, increase your visibility on the net? Because I did a search for hearing aids some time ago, and they came up with all of us in the USA who might be marketing yours from their price structure, but I didn't see you guys. Hearing aids as a search term is actually quite expensive. <laughs> it's actually extremely expensive. So um, we obviously missed you, but we have a lot, we put a lot of effort into, um, well, we don't do it ourselves, we've actually outsourced this uh, uh, to try and get better at it. But it's a really good question, because being smart about using um, internet search terms of marketing is really, really important and it's something we're trying to really get much, much better at. We do a lot of analytics on our, our uh, 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 we look at our data a lot and get help. Yes. I was thinking about your comments before about growing internationally and scaling around the world. My question is, and it sounds cheeky, my question is, is your product distinctive and is it a breakthrough product or is it your business model which is a breakthrough business model helping you achieve the success that you have? Uh, it's kind of both. I mean, the hearing aid is, a very, it, is, is very good. We've also kept it fairly simple. We don't have lots of that on gadgets. So it's, it's in a class of its own in terms of um, sound and versatility in different environments, but that's not enough to sell a hearing aid. So it is in fact a products and services model, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't rushed into international, because it will need the appropriate service support, um, if not in country, certainly in region. Um, hello everyone, I'm Beth Webster, the Director of the Centre for Transformative Innovation at Swinburne. I just forced to me to do the vote of thanks to Elaine. Um, it's a really inspirational speech uh, and what I really get out of it every time I hear people like Elaine talk is how multi-skilled they are. They've got to be good at marketing, they've got to be good at finance, good at connections, good at science, obviously, uh, good at manufacturing, good at knowing what's going on in the world, good at business models. Um, and I'm just in incredibly grateful that you migrated to Australia and you decided to make this your home. Um, and also, it's, it's what really comes through clearly is you've got, you've, you've got these personal qualities of perseverance. 
um, breaking the rules and, and keeping on going, which in the end, uh, rules are there, I think, because uh, talking to you before the lecture, um, there are so many times at which you could stop, justifiably give up and, and just become like the rest of us. So, um, <laughs> So I, we said, Margaret said we we're going to give out two prizes to the two people who had asked the best questions. Margaret, do you have a preference? No, that's what I was going to do. Okay. Uh, so I'm going, to, my, my, I'm going to show my biases here because I'm an economist. I'm going to go for uh, one prize to the uh, woman up the back who asked about the business model versus the product beside the camera. You can come down and get a clap. And the other to the... over there with the scarf on who asked a few questions about business models and prices. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we have some upcoming events um, later in the month and in the year. Um, it, later in July, we have Alexander Gosling and Professor Court Seaman talking about outsourcing your technology problems. Uh, then in September, we have uh, some more of the Clooney's Ross winners, and in October, we have uh, another Clooney's Ross winner, Mary Smith and Peter Murphy. We really encourage and hope you'll come along to hear those as well. Uh, we do have um, drinks and some small hors d'oeuvres outside. We hope you'll stay and talk to people. Um, and so finally, I'd just like again to thank um, Elaine for coming. Uh, thank my two other co-sponsors, uh, Luan Ismail and, and Margaret Hartley from ATSI and Convergent Science, and Mitchell Adams for organising the whole event. He's outside. <laughs> <laughs>